Um, right, so good morning. Thank you very much um, for inviting me. Um, and I really welcome the opportunity to, uh, to show you what can happen and to hopefully instill some urgency and kind of backing to really get together on some useful projects that may <coughs> help find a solution if there's to be one. I've seen the report from the Redskin uh, Disease Conference in 2019, Ken kindly sent me. I can see a lot of work has already been done and I hope to learn more today. However, it's quite possible that this is even more complicated than I so far know, but maybe Charlotte will fill something in on that. Um, and that Redskin can trigger another issue that occurs concurrently and confuses reporting and identifying what's actually going on. Um, next slide. That worked. 80% um, of the returned adult salmon died in one of the rivers you're about to see last summer. Um, I'm going to show you fish at various stages of decline in health uh, in two rivers, both special areas of conservation for Atlantic salmon. I appreciate this may not be the case with red skin everywhere, but this level of mortality can occur in some smaller rivers, I think. Some liken UDN to red skin disease, but there's a big difference in the consequences of the level of mortality of already returned adults from the 1970s to now. With smoked to adult survival of over 10% in the 1970s, losing 80% of a run wouldn't necessarily be a biological disaster. Not good for the fishery, of course. But now we're getting one or 2% returning to many rivers, so these are a very precious commodity. You lose 80% of one or 2%, um, and you have spawning burns that are now devoid of spawning adults. Yes, we can get away with one year of lost fish, like happened last year, and you, you were talking uh, about one year was bad and the next year was okay. But if we have two or three years in a row on some of these rivers, then you're into reintroducing fish um, or waiting for natural um, repopulation, which, given ocean survival, is going to take longer than it would have in the past. And I recognize that one of the most difficult issues facing us, studying and diagnosing diseases, especially novel diseases in, in fish, is observing timescales and severity in the early stages of the disease. Um, once fish are moribund, they're quite easy to observe, but they have so much going on and so much wrong with them that it's almost impossible to tell what the initial trigger to the decline in health was. Next slide. I'm lucky to be involved with the Berrydale and Langwell, where the owners and management are happy to do whatever it takes to solve this issue, if it can be. So a note to everybody out there who wants to study this and get to the bottom of it, we, we have willing partners. But how serious is it, and is it localised, and why did so many fish die here last year? Next slide. And I should add a little caveat in here. So a notable issue with the Langwell was a landslide that occurred a few years back. This meant spring fish were trapped below it in a shaded gorge pool until late summer rain gave enough opportunity to ascend it. Last year, the dry summer meant fish coming up until September were unable to migrate <coughs> upstream and were stuck in a four to 500 meter section of river. This is the entire run breeding population. This created a reasonably high density of fish where things got ugly very quickly when fresh fish came in and encountered red skin diseased residents. Thankfully, this barrier has now righted itself, the bottom picture there, um, to an extent. But that, that's actually quite easy for them to get up, believe it or not. Um, and I should add that this, this gorge, you wonder why didn't somebody do anything about it. It's in an inaccessible gorge for mechanical work, and about 100 tonnes of rock fell in. We tried with pinch bars, but there was no way. The, the, the main point is, though, that the trapped and stressed fish seemed to succumb worse than those spread out more evenly. And this fits with other rivers where they had red skin nearby. Next slide. There have been reports of high numbers of fish with red skin on the force for a few years longer than the Langwell and Berrydale, although it has been observed in the spring on both the Langwell and Berrydale since 2016, but it never escalated like last year in the past. The disease is showing signs of being spread and the number of rivers with it is growing each year. We will all have heard of the significant mortalities on the Findhorn um, already this year. In the Hebrides, using the precautionary principle, 
We have already issued guidance that all visiting anglers should clean all their fishing gear on arrival in case there's a pathogen, and we provide disinfecting equipment to fisheries that do not have it on their own. Um, I believe red skin disease is often misdiagnosed, even in the simplest form of there being red skin, perhaps. <laughs> I'm not a scientist. You can observe fish with all the signs of red skin from above, and many a fishery manager or angler points them out and says, oh, look, there's fish, they've got red skin. But actually, many of them do not have any red skin at all, but are still succumbing. Next slide. So last year, I was commissioned to film Wild Atlantic Salmon for a documentary series. Um, and I've been filming for more than 20 years, but this resulted in a, un a unique opportunity to intimately observe fish over a whole freshwater migration. Unfortunately, the rivers <laughs> I'd, I'd been given were the Langwell and Perrydale, and they suffered their worst outbreak to date or, um, of red skin, and had um, a dry summer which exacerbated the issues. Um, and it became almost impossible to get shots, nice shots of beautiful Atlantic salmon, without some of them being diseased. So it was very, very difficult filming. I hope what you're about to see helps those with a better understanding of fish health, uh, with the early stage diagnosis of, or search for a cause, causative agent. I hope someone here viewing later on YouTube will spot something related to other research which leads to a solution. To this end, and you'll shortly see why, I think we also need to be looking more closely at saprolegnia. Um, now, if you play the... Uh, the video, and I hope it has sound, because I did a little voiceover to explain. It's, it's very quite distressing to see that. It's quite distressing to see red-skinned fish in the latter stages towards death. These fish were from the Hebrides in 2020, and to date it appears to be an isolated incident in one small river. We organised sterilisation of all gear of those who'd been there, not knowing what it was and whether or not it could spread to other fisheries. Here we can see a typical fish with red skin and onset of secondary saprolegnia infection. Here's another with quite extreme red skin and saprolegnia infection on the belly, which is unusual in normal infections. This moribund fish shows typical red skin on the belly and saprolegnia infection on the back and fins, as do this pair, as seen from above. We cannot see red skin directly, so this is an assumption many make when seeing fish like this. In 2021, throughout the lower Berrydale and Langwell rivers, the pools were filled with fish with red skin disease and saprolegnia infection. From above, it is difficult to tell whether red skin is present or not. If we step back a few years, 2014, we can see the exact same pools with plenty of fish in perfect condition. These pools are shaded and there's been no change to land use around the river. This was also a dry year, but before red skin disease had been reported. In 2018, a particularly dry summer in the region, large numbers of fish were trapped in the Langwell below the falls, as highlighted earlier and also these fish in the Berrydale, as late as September, showing good health. These are all the same locations and similar dry years to last year, where red skin was prevalent from the spring onwards. What you can see here are fresh fish in a pool that is 10 metres above the high tide mark. None of them are displaying any signs of red skin, but you'll already be noticing saprolegnia infections. All the pools had fish like this, and I'm seeing no signs of red skin disease on the majority of them. As you can see here, the fish in the foreground has a higher infection, but there are dots on the fish behind. Red skin disease was, however, present in the vicinity, as the clips earlier in this video illustrate. This pool is a couple of hundred metres upstream, is deep, secure and shaded by trees. You can see saprolegnia infections starting on these fresh fish. Of course, it happens on the areas where we'd expect the mucous membranes to be thinnest. These fish were fresh off the tide, and notice the tiny patch of saprolegnia forming already. 
By the time fish died, they nearly always had some signs of red skin. But notice this fish, moribund and was dead by the next day. Plenty saprolegnia, but no red skin evidence whatsoever. A little further upstream, you can see a fish here with small patches of saprolegnia on its flank and belly. Here in the same pool, a little further up at the neck, we see a small school of fresh grills with small patches of saprolegnia starting to show. This fish that comes in at the end from the left also is showing little signs of red skin, I think. A little further upstream again, in an exposed pool, all the adult salmon died. These all showed signs of red skin, not just saprolegnia. Ultimately, this led to a miserable situation in the two rivers, where on one evening Anson and myself removed 70 fish. On subsequent days, for the entire stay, I removed between 5 and 10 fish per day. I know the advice is to leave fish in the water, but by now tourists were stopping on the bridge and taking photographs and posting it on social media. We also thought it might be an idea to try and remove a source of some pathogen from the water, even though one hadn't been identified. We had by now engaged with the Fish Health Inspectorate, and on two occasions they came out and took samples of two fish and four fish, both at the moribund stage. I sent videos to Mark at Atlantic Salmon Trust, who passed them around their team. We also engaged with the Scottish Salmon Company's veterinary team, and Dave Cockrell put us on to Teresa Garzon of Patagen, a company that they use extensively. Michael Hill of the Scottish Salmon Company kindly came up and conducted autopsies on five fish, some of which were moribund, but one I caught on the fly and was perfectly fresh and in good health. Nothing conclusive came from the results. No known pathogen was found. Despite myself and lack of technical understanding, seeing saprolegnia infections without any red skin led me to believe that perhaps red skin and saprolegnia infections were acting independently of one another and that saprolegnia was acting as a primary infector, even though I'd been told this was not possible. Maybe red skin, bad as it is alone, can trigger another issue in certain types of river and that this combination can be biologically catastrophic for the salmon. Not pleasant viewing. Uh, it wasn't pleasant experiencing it. I did shed a few tears on the odd evening taking fish out when you're trying to show them at their best. Um, so as a result of the investigation observation, I went in search of saprolegnia experts instead of red skin experts. Um, convinced the advice I was given was incorrect, that saprolegnia can be a primary infector. I found the very helpful Peter Van West, who is also engaged with the North Esk, I believe, with their issues, and, and he's here today. Um, so ask him plenty of questions too. There's lots of people need to meet. Um, from what you've seen, under certain, certain circumstances, things can be catastrophic for a breeding population. And also that sunburn isn't a cause here, in, the, in these pools which has been uh, mentioned. Um, red skin isn't present in a great deal of these fish, uh, dying fish, and saprolegnia takes hold on sea-liced fish within hours of entering fresh water, which is something I've never seen before. But red skin being present in recent years has been a constant, and there was never an issue, as you saw, before um, with saprolegnia before red skin uh, appeared. But it could be coincidence. There's two final points to make and expand on. I'll touch on a little more on the saprolegnia uh, and work shared with me by Professor Peter Van West of Aberdeen University, who probably should be delivering this part of my talk, but uh, I shall do my best. So, the next, next slide, yeah. thank you. Um, saprolegnia shows signs that it's programmed to infect and kill fish. We know that secreting proteins by the pathogen that enter host cells and then chop down RNA inside is something that only primary pathogens would do. Saprolegnia can do this. Also, saprolegnia is, all, is able to actively suppress immune responses in the host. Again, something only primary pathogens tend to do. 
Sequencing saprolagnia isolates is being done by Peter Van West and team in, uh, from Aberdeen University. And in the studies, phylogenetic plate one, is that correct? Uh, seems to be the saprolagnia parasitica pathogen prevalent on salmon. Maybe saprolagnia is rampant in rivers first infected with red skin and just escalates um, and where conditions are optimal. Next. For sure, some of these listed factors, which are key to saprolagnia infection, uh, are in play on the Force uh, in the North Scotland, the Langwell and the Berrydell, and no doubt other rivers. Will they be exacerbated by the changes in climate we're already experiencing? especially in the north and east. And I, and I think perhaps this is a way that climate change is expressing itself, unfortunately. And, and finally, to give you a perspective on how severe this issue is for individual populations, here's the electrofishing data for the last nine years on the Lithmore site on the Force. Uh, there's a second site to come in a minute uh, on the second site. But you can see here, this is the total biomass per meter squared of a site they've got constant records for, and red skin disease started in around 2016. So you've gone from a very, very good 10 to 12 grams per meter squared down to about one, and worryingly is the percentage of fry in this. Um, next slide. Now this is above Shurrury Dam, where the fish can spread out. Now. It's not quite as catastrophic here, where the fish are spread out more, and, and it offered some protection for the adults from the disease. But again, we're down at 50% um, of what the carrying capacity is. So it tells you a story that the smoke production is going to be clearly impacted when we have times of ocean survival at their lowest, and they're returning and, pick, and getting red skin disease, and with certain conditions, suffering very, very high mortality. And final slide, sorry. All this leads us back to the, the basic questions I put up at the beginning, which to a layman and fishery manager like myself, not a scientist, um, I've, I've kind of added some very tentative answers. It may be that some fisheries will ride out red skin disease, and I believe so, having looked at other rivers with red skin, they don't seem to suffer the secondary impacts, but others will be perhaps wiped out completely if we don't do something about it. I hope we can make a difference before too long. So, thank you. <laughs>